right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to lecture number 20 for CS135. And uh, there's a few announcements that you should be aware of. First off, you still have assignments 8 and assignment 9. Assignment 8 is going to be due on Monday of next week. Note it is Monday, not Tuesday, that it is due. And um, the other thing is that assignment 9 is also due next week, but on Friday instead. And um, you might be concerned that there are two assignments due in the same week, but if you take a look at assignment 9, you'll see it's actually very, very, very short. So don't be too, too worried about it. Uh, some other things to make note of is that if you are having difficulties accessing either Twitch or YouTube to watch the lecture videos, please do let us know and we can have the videos uploaded to a third party source that is accessible from everywhere. Of course, if you're having troubles with this, you probably can't see this message either. Um, some other details that you should be aware of. Um, are that tutorials are still going to be happening, but they are probably also going to be streamed as well, just like the lecture videos. So there should be a tutorial this week and a tutorial next week as well. And um, as I mentioned in the last lecture, we are going to have a final assessment. It is optional, but I would highly recommend that you do it. It's because what we're going to do is you'll have two options and we're going to choose whichever grading scheme gives you the highest grade. So in order to get yourself in the best possible position, it makes sense to, to actually do that optional final assessment. And the final assessment details will be coming shortly, but essentially you're going to have 10 days to do a few small tasks. And some of that will be through learn and some of that will be like a traditional assignment. And, um, it will be graded like an assignment, but more details to come uh, with that shortly. Uh, another thing that I want to make sure is that everybody is staying safe and healthy. And if you're running into any particular issues, please don't be afraid to reach out to us and we can see what resources we can push your way just for help in general. And uh, finally, one last thing to make mention is that obviously the world has gone upside down in a matter of a couple weeks. And um, I mean, otherwise we would actually be having in-person lectures, but there are still course evaluations. Um, they are being run differently this term than in previous terms. So there is a website, which I've posted the link to Piazza, and you would fill your evaluation out there. And it's completely anonymous, so don't worry. We don't know who's leaving what message. Um, traditionally, those evaluations would go to everybody in the department, and that would be used to determine, you know, who can teach in future terms. Um, due to the crazy situation in the world, the only people who will be able to see the evaluations will actually be the instructor. Um, but we would still appreciate your feedback, and hopefully you've actually had a good term so far, despite all the crazy. Uh, all right, I think that was all of the announcements that I actually had. So what I'd like to do then is move over to doing some review problems. So let's switch over there. All right. So we'll full screen this. What we've got here is um, a few problems. One is we want you to use map to implement the following functions. So the first function, we want you to take a list of numeric grades, so just a list of numbers, and those numbers are going to be between 0 and 100, and we want you to convert that into credit or no credit symbols according to the fact that if you scored less than 50, you get no credit, and if you get greater than or equal to 50, then that would give you a credit. So that's the first problem. And then the second problem is to use map to implement a function that is going to extract all of the keys from an association list. So if you remember, an association list is a list of pairs. Each pair has a key and a value. So we want you to take an association list and just give me all the keys using that. Okay. Now, I'm not going to give you time to actually sit there and work on this because obviously that would be just me staring at the camera for five minutes. But let's go over to Rackens. Let's rack it. And I've actually got these uh, implemented here. 
So the first function is this no credit to, or converting numerical grades to credit or no credit. So the first thing we have to know is map takes two arguments. So the first argument to map is going to be the function that you want to apply to each element in the list. And then the second argument is actually going to be the list itself that you want to apply that to. Now, in truth, map takes more arguments than that, or it can take more arguments than that because it can process multiple lists at the same time. We're not going to worry about that. We're just going to deal with one function and one list. So the function that I want to apply to each element of the list is I want to check and I want to say if the, this current element of the list is less than 50, I should replace it with a symbol NCR and otherwise replace it with the symbol CR. So you can see here that's what our lambda function actually does. So we have, a, remember that functions for map need to take one argument and then inside I have a cond and it checks if the value x, which is the current element of the list, is less than 50, produce the symbol. Otherwise, we're going to produce the symbol for credit. So, question of course is, does this work? Well, let's do a real quick test here. And 23, that one we know shouldn't pass. 50 should pass, but 49 shouldn't. And let's make sure 100 works. So there's four grades, and you can see that all of the ones that we anticipated should get a credit, get a credit, and those that don't, don't. Okay. So that's the first one. Now the second problem on that list was we want to extract all of the keys from an association list. That's actually a pretty easy problem. So one of the things to remember is that a list can contain other lists, and that's exactly what an association list is. So just to remember, we've got an AL entry is key value, and then an AL is one of empty, or we also have a AL, where an AL is a cons entry AL. There you go. Sorry, we had a bit of a disconnection issue there. That's what happens when you're on Wi-Fi. So I want to write a map function that takes an AL and gives me the first element of each of the sublists. Well, actually, the only function I need to do that is first. So to implement our function, get keys from an association list, we actually just pass first as the function into map. So to show you that this works, we'll call create a fake association list here. Um, and let's let symbols There we go, we have an association list that maps symbols to numbers, so the keys are symbols. So when I call get keys, I'm expecting to get a list of just the keys. So my list should contain symbols A, B, C, and D. So if we call get keys, there we go, list A, B, C, D. Not too bad. Now, one thing I want to remind you of is that map has a very unique contract. So if we're looking at the map contract, we know that it takes a function and we are always tempted to say it's, you know, a function that consumes anything and produces anything. And then map also takes a list of any and then produces a list of any. But this is actually not accurate enough. So we're going to put some big X's here. This is wrong. And then the correct map contract then. The function is going to consume something that is the same type as the elements of the list. So we're going to parameterize the type. So we get x, and so my list contains a list of x. Now, we just, in our first example here, we transformed numbers into symbols. So it's very clear that whatever the function is we passed to map, it has to produce something of a different type. So we're going to parameterize that type to the letter y. And then we're going to say, so our map takes a function, x produces y, 
and a list of x, and it produces a list of y. So there's our contract for map, just for memory. All right, so those are some map review problems. Now I want to go back and review, do some problems with our other good friend, Mr. Foldar. All right, so here we have a very simple, and I know you can't see the list, Give me a second, I will make it so you can see the list. Whee, there we go. All right, so we have the list, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And I wanna use fold R to sum the list. But the question is what order does fold R actually sum this list? So I've given you two options here. One where you're folding from the left, that is you're adding from the left. So we would add zero plus one, and then the sum of that plus two, and the sum of that plus three, that's option A. Or the other one, which is B, we're gonna go from the right, which is we're going to add our base case zero to 10, and then add that to nine, and then add, add that sum to eight. So I've kind of already given away the answer here, but, the answer is actually B, fold R, fold from the right. So if we remember this is following that simple recursive template, so it's going to build up and then it's going to start the evaluation from the right and move our way towards the left. All right, so then, let's put this back up here, there we go. So now let's try to implement some functions using fold R. So two functions we want to implement. One is I want to count the number of even numbers in a list of numbers. And the second one is I'm given a list of numbers and I want to compute the average of that list. And I want to make sure that I'm using fold R and not length or any of those other kinds of functions. Okay, so let's go over to Rock, Dr. Rocket then. And, um, that was a lot of scrolling really fast. So let's get rid of this. There we go. So the first one, I want to count the number of even elements in my list. So full R, remember, takes three arguments. The first one is a function. The second one is the base case value. And the third one is the list we're applying this to. So I want to count the number of even numbers. What is the base case for that? Well, the base case is I have an empty list, so I have no even numbers because I have no numbers. So my base case is going to be zero. And as you can see here that I've highlighted, we've set our base case to zero as expected. Now the list part, we know we're just going to in the count evens pass our list in. Then we have to think about what is the function I'm going to apply to count the number of evens. Okay, so if you remember, fold R is following that simple recursive template where we are going to combine in some way the first element of the list with the result we get from the rest of the list. So. I'm using some function to combine this element with the result I get from the already solved rest of the list. So if you look at the function we're doing, the second argument to the function is going to be the result from the rest of the list. We've already computed the rest of the list. Now I need to use this function to combine element x, which is this element, with the result from the rest of the list. So I'm going to assume that count is the number of even numbers in the rest of the list. And then I want to combine checking x with the result from counting the rest of the element. Well, that's actually quite simple. We are going to add one to count if x is even, otherwise we just produce count because there are no even. So that's exactly what we've done here. We have a condition, and in it, we are checking if x is even. And if it is, I call add one count. Otherwise, I just produce count. So does it work is always the question. So let's do count 
evens, and let's give any random list. Oops. Helps if I spell it properly. It's not events, it's evens. There we go. There are five evens. Well, let's see. Two, four, six, eight, ten. Five evens. So that works. Pretty cool. Now, the second one is a lot trickier. Okay, it's a little sneaky. Because in order to compute the average, you need to know how many elements are in the list. Well, actually, that's not that bad. So, what I decided to do was to use not full R not once, but use full R twice. So if you look at my solution for average, we've got two folder applications of folder. The first application of folder is really simple. The function I'm using to combine this element with the result for the rest of the list is add. So really what this folder plus zero list is doing, it's summing the list, which means that's the numerator in computing the average. So I've got my numerator. Now I'm dividing that by this full R result here. And what this full R does is you'll notice it completely ignores the current element of the list. All it does is for each time that you evaluate it, we add one to the result we've got so far, which means the second full R here is computing the length of the list. How many numbers are in this list? So I'm dividing the sum of the numbers by the total number of elements that there are. And we can, of course, do this as well. Test it out. So let's do average. And um, let's do, let's make it easy on ourselves. Let's do the average of 0 and 100, which gives us 50 exactly what we would anticipate. Now, is that the only way that you could do average with full R? Probably not. You could probably do it in much more interesting ways. Um, and I'll leave that as an exercise for you to figure out. All right. So. I want to do one more example with Boldar that wasn't actually in the uh, problems. And what this is, is I want to use fold R and on an association list to swap keys and values. So if we had an association list that looked like this, uh, let's say A1, B2, C3, I want the swap function to turn this into the following association list. So we've swapped the keys and the values. So I'm going to use fold R instead of combining our results into a single number like the previous two examples did. I'm going to use fold R to produce a new list. That's totally doable. Because remember what the function in fold R is doing is it's combining, manipulating this element with the results of whatever it is we were doing on the rest of the list. So the second argument to the lambda function in fold R is the result we've gotten so far. And we are combining, for the rest of the list that is. So we are just trying to combine the current item with the solution we get from the rest of the list, the already solved bits. So let's look at this function here. It's actually really simple. I'm going to split it up onto several lines here so you can see it a bit better. So my function for swap that I'm passing into fold R consumes the pair, that's the entry, the key value pair. It's a two element list and it consumes an association list. And that association list is the result of swapping keys and values on a smaller list. That is the rest of the list. So I want to swap the key and value of the current item and add that in some way onto the result of the already swapped rest of the list. Well, if I want to add a result onto the rest of the list, I'm going to use cons. So you can see here we have cons. And then to perform the swap, I create a list 
where second is now first and first is second. So I'm swapping the key and the value and I cons that onto the result of swapping the rest of the list. And then my base case when I want to produce a new list is usually going to be empty. When our list is empty, our base case is almost always empty. And then I pass a list in. So let's see if it works. Using the same example from before. There we go. We've swapped it. And now we've got the keys. The old keys are now the values and the old values are now the keys. Now, a couple things we didn't talk about last class, or we didn't finish, was what is the contract for Foldar? We've built it for filter, we've built it for map, and we sort of built it for Foldar, but we didn't actually finish it. So let's actually try to finish the contract for Foldar. It's really helpful to see it. So you've got fold R, and we know it consumes a function. And that function actually needs to take two arguments this element of the list and the results of running this on the rest of the list. So we'll start with this any representation, even though by now I hope you know that the any is wrong, or at least not accurate enough. So we've got our function, and then we've got our base case, and we've got our list of any, and it's going to produce anything. Not accurate. So let's draw some big X's here. This is totally wrong. Wrong, 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 wrong. So let's build the correct one now. Well, whatever our list is, it has some type. And since we know the first argument to the function pass to fold R is going to be a single element from the list, the type of the list and the first argument to the fold R function have to be the same. So let's parameterize it to X. Now, what about the base case? I could take a list of numbers and I could turn it into a list of symbols. I could take a list of symbols and I could turn it into a single number. So the type of my base case should not be necessarily the same as the type of the items in the list. So we're going to parameterize that as well as type Y. So I'm going to say my base case has type Y, which means that the second argument to fold R's function should also be of type Y. Now, what does that function produce? Also something of type Y. Because Y is the result of running this on the rest of the list, which means that the second argument and the function's produced value should be the same type. So we've got all the arguments. Now, what is the result? Well, what is the type of the result that's produced by the function we pass to fold R? It's Y, and so, so is fold R. So that's a rather complicated contract, but hopefully you see why that actually is. Now, if you're wondering, well, what if I have a list of numbers and I want to produce a list of, produce a list of numbers? Is this represented by this particular contract? And the answer is yes, because all you have to remember is that Y could also be equal to x. There's no restriction saying y can't be equal to x, so that's totally fine. All right, so my advice to you is to get some practice using Foldar. Most people find map and filter fairly trivial, but Foldar is kind of tricky, and there are lots of different ways that you can look at it. You can look at it from how we discussed recursion. You can look at it from the simple recursion template. You can look at it as we're evaluating things right to left, there's many approaches to looking at Foldar. The best way to learn it is to practice it. So we'll see about getting you some practice problems uh, for Foldar as well. And of course, assignment nine, you get lots of practice for these two. All right. So now I would like to go back to the slides. There we go. And we're going to We left off actually talking about um, the function mymap using Foldar. And, um, well, this isn't actually that bad of a function. 
What we've seen is Foldar, because it follows the simple recursion template, we can actually use Foldar to implement map and to implement filter. And that's actually pretty cool. And in fact, you can pretty much use Foldar to implement any of the other abstract list functions. But I will leave the last two, which are fold, al, and build list, up to you. So speaking of which, let's move on and look at uh, other templates that we could build. So we're going to skip this slide here. There we go. What other kinds of recursions do we have? Um, well, we've done a whole bunch of simple recursive templates. What about abstract or not abstract recursion, accumulative recursion? What about generative recursion? Can we use abstract list functions to represent those kinds of recursion? Maybe. But before we get into that, here's one of the things that you might be wondering. Do we need our list template anymore? Now that we have these abstract list functions and we've seen that Foldar can pretty much do anything you could ever need, do I really need to provide people with that list template? And you might be tempted to think it's obsolete and you don't need it anymore and who cares about it. But here's my argument. When you look at a piece of code that's implemented using Foldar, it can be really hard to read. The little samples that we did in Racket, they're, they're not so bad, but you can get Foldars inside of Foldars, inside of Lambdas, inside of other Foldars. It's not very readable. Very efficient, very simple piece of code, but very hard to read, very hard to maintain, very hard to think about. That list template is really helpful for figuring out the problem, but also for providing an extra layer of readability. You're giving the person the idea of, hey, this is how I'm using this particular data structure. This particular list is using this particular way, and it will help with the readability of your code. So you still have to provide list templates as appropriate. Okay. So then let's move on to the, our other abstract list functions. And in particular, let's look at, can we generalize a cumulative recursion? Obviously, you know, the answer is yes. Uh, otherwise we wouldn't be talking about it. So, we have built many functions using simple recursion. And we also showed you how most of those functions could be translated quite easily to using a cumulative recursion. I remember a cumulative recursion is different from simple because simple recursion, we have two arguments or a single argument, really. Um, any other arguments would be along for the right. But with each recursive application, we are moving exactly one step towards our base case. And if we have other arguments, they don't change, they go along for the ride. With a cumulative recursion, we add another parameter, and that is we allow an accumulator that stores the results so far. So we can compute the sum of the list using a cumulative recursion. And when we do a cumulative recursion, because we don't want to expose that accumulator to the user, we usually need to have a wrapper function or a localized helper. And that's what we've done here is we've actually localized the actual recursive function inside of the wrapper. So our wrapper is just called sum list and it consumes a list. And then we call our actual accumulative recursive function here to do the sum. And you'll see here it takes the list and our accumulator is the sum so far. And we pass zero as the sum so far as being the initial value because we haven't added anything yet. Are there other valid initial values? Yes. And I'll let you think about what that could be. Then in our accumulative recursive function, we note that if the list is empty, then the sum of the list is contained in the accumulator. So produce the accumulator. Otherwise, we are going to sum the remainder of the list. So we call the, our accumulator on the rest of the list. And then we update the sum so far to include the first element. So Here's us using the rest of the list. And then we update the sum so far by adding the current element to the sum so far. And this is very good at simplifying a lot of more complex things that we would do with simple recursion. For example, you computing the maximum uh, of a list can be rather complex or very, very slow with simple recursion. And with accumulative recursion, it's really fast and it's really easy to understand. 
So this is summing the list of the cumulative recursion. Okay. Now let's look at another function which is really common with the cumulative recursion, and that is I have a list and I want to reverse it. Okay, again, we are going to use a localized helper function. We've got it here inside of our wrapper. So I want to reverse the list. So my, my accumulator is going to be the reversed list so far, which means before I've processed a single element in my list, the reverse list so far is empty. So you see here, we call with the initial accumulative recursive value being empty. Now in the function, if the list is empty, that is we processed every element, then the so far is going to have our reverse list, so we produce that. Otherwise, we're going to reverse the rest of the list and we cons the first of the list onto the results of the rest of the list, which were already reversed. Or, sorry, not the rest of the list, the amount of the list we've reversed so far. Okay. Two very different functions. They do two very different things. But wait a minute, let's go back. Do they really look that different? If you look at the format of these two very different functions, blur your eyes a little bit and swap between these two, and you're like, wait a minute, these two functions actually look the same. What are the differences? The differences between the two is what is the initial value of the accumulator? Okay. For reversing the list, it was empty. For summing the list, it was zero. If we were multiplying the list, it would be one. If we were doing some other task, it the initial value of the accumulator depends on what you're doing. If we're doing the max, we often use the first of the list. But how we use the accumulator is the same. So when we're summing, if the list is empty, we produce the accumulator. If we're reversing, the list is empty, we produce the accumulator. Two different functions, we do the same thing when the list is empty. What do we do when the list is not empty? Well, we call the accumulative recursive function on the rest of the list. Oh, look, we do that in both. And then we update the accumulator to include this element combined with the results so far. So for summing the list, we add the first of the list to the sum so far, and that's our new sum so far. And for the reverse of the list, consing the first onto the reversed so far gives us a new so far. Okay. So we need to abstract two, we can abstract this because the only thing that's different here is the initial value of the accumulator and the function that we use to combine the first of the list with the result so far. Which means we have an abstract function we can create. And this function actually has a name, it's called fold L, fold from the left. So if we were to sum up the numbers, instead of going from the right, we're now going to go from the left. And it consumes three arguments, just like fold R. The first is a function that is going to combine this element with the so far result. The second is the initial value of the accumulator. And the third thing is the list. Not too bad. How do we implement it then? Well, if we were to just blur our eyes between the accumulative recursive sum and accumulative recursive reverse, we would see what the pattern looks like. So we create my fold L. Here it is here. And you can see here we have a wrapper and it takes the function to combine this with this accumulator, the base, which is what is the initial value of the accumulator and our list. We have a local helper that actually does the accumulative recursion because we want to hide that again. And so inside we are going to call this with our list and our base case, our base value for the accumulator. And you'll see here that Again, if the list is empty, we produce the accumulator because we're done. Otherwise, we call fold L on the rest of the list 
and we use the parameterized function combine to combine this result with this first item with the result we got so far. So there we go, we have fold L. We have an abstract list function for both simple recursion in fold R, and we now have an abstract list function for cumulative recursion in fold L. And now we can go back and we can implement some list and my reverse using fold L. And they're one-liners, and that's beautiful. So here we have some list. Ta-da, we just pass some, and here's reverse. We just pass cons. All right. So you now have one, two, three, four abstract list functions to play with. Now it can be very confusing to figure out what is the difference between how fold R and how fold L are evaluated. But one of the easiest things to remember is that fold R uses simple recursion. We are going to be evaluating from the right. <clears throat> Sorry, I've been yelling at my kids all morning. <clears throat> so with fold R, we fold from the right. And with fold L, we're doing a cumulative recursion, so we're combining from the left. And if you actually look at this in terms of summing two lists of numbers, with fold R, you would be going from 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, and for full L, you're going to sum 1, 2, 3, 4. All right, now here's a challenge for you if you're sitting at home and you're bored to tears because you don't have to go to class and you don't have to socialize and you don't have anything to do. Try to implement fold L using fold R. See if you can do that. All right. Now, what is the contract of fold out? Well, let's take a look. We've got the contract of fold R here. Let's build the contract of fold L. So, fold L, let's make sure I call it the right thing. What is it going to do? Well, it consumes a function that combines the first of the list with the accumulator to produce a new so far result. And it consumes an initial value for the accumulator and a list of things. So we could start off with in this again, any, any produces any, the accumulator could be any, list of any, hopefully by now you know that this is not right. It's it just doesn't capture some of the intricate details. Um, this using any for fold out and fold out and filter and map, it doesn't represent the fact that the function you provide has to actually work on the things that are in the list. If I call first on a list of number on a number, it's going to produce an error. This is why this is wrong. And you're probably hearing some squealing. My kids are playing in the basement. Again, so what is the correct fold R or fold out? Fold out. Let's make sure we spell it right. Well, actually, it's the same as fold R's contract. So we know that if we have a list of something, that the something must be the first argument that's consumed by our combination function. So it has to be x, and it has to be a list of x. Now our accumulator is going to have an initial type y, which may be equal to x. x and y could technically be the same thing. That's okay. Which means that since the combination function takes the first element of type x and combines it with the accumulator, it means that the second argument to our combination function has to be the same type as the accumulator, which is y. And then this is a supposed to produce a new result so far, which means it's going to produce something of type Y. And then of course, the result is whatever the accumulator is at the end, because that's what we would produce. And so should also be type Y. So there you go. Fold R and fold L have the exact same contract.
All right. Now, what kinds of things can you do with full vowel? Well, what kinds of things can you do with accumulative recursion? Could we do something like compute the max of a list of numbers or the min of a list of numbers? Of course you can. Can because you can do that with accumulative recursion. And all we had to do was check which one of these two things is bigger. So let's actually try that here. Let's get a new tab. Just gonna have a new tab here. So let's try to define the max of a list of numbers using fold L for cumulative recursion. So we're gonna call it my max because max is a built-in function. And we're just gonna have a list. Now let's use fold L here. Okay. I need a function that's going to take this element and the max so far and give me the max of those two. You might be thinking, do we need to make a lambda function for that? And the answer is no. You could just use max here. Because max consumes two things, or two or more things, and it produces the max of those things. So we can call fold out max. And then what is the initial max value? It's our initial value of the accumulator. You can set it to zero, and I think a lot of people get really tempted to set the initial max to zero, but that's wrong. Because if all of the items in your list are negative numbers and you set the accumulator, the initial maximum to zero, zero is not in your list, but that's what this would produce. So your initial max for your accumulator should actually be the first of the list. And then we have to keep track of the fact that we've already processed the first of the list. So we're going to call this on the rest of the list. So there we go. We'll run that. And now we'll call my max on and, and it gives us our expected maximum there. there. So, so what, what other things could you use full val for? Again, full val is an abstract list template for cumulative recursion. So anywhere where you could use a cumulative recursion, you can use full val. Now, do we have a preference as to whether you solve problems that could be solved with simple recursion or cumulative recursion? Do we care whether you use fold L or fold R? No, we don't care. If we do not specify which abstract list function you should use, solve it however you want. However, be very careful in a lot of the assignment questions because you will note that we're very clear about wanting a question to be solved with one of the particular abstract list functions. And sometimes we'll be like, hey, solve it with this one, and now solve it with the other one. And actually, that's some really good practice, is can you solve it with fold R? OK, now can you solve it with fold L? So do that. And something, if you're looking for more practice, is we've got modules on modules of recursion. Go back and implement everything with fold R, and then implement everything with fold L. There are tons of things that you already have that you can practice with. And if that's not enough practice for you, go to it with the assignments. Now, I know this probably seems irrelevant because you're not going to have the traditional sit down paper exam, but I think it's still good to really understand the differences between these two. All right, so we have map, filter, fold R, and fold out. Are there any others? Obviously. Yes, yes, there are. are. So, so let's go back here. We have one known as fill list. So we have created an abstract list function for our simple recursion on a list, and we've created an abstract list function for um, a cumulative recursion on a list. But there's one type of recursion, well, there's a lot of types of recursions we haven't really thought about, and let's go back to simple recursion. We had the function count up and the function count down. And those two functions consumed a number and produced a list. They were using simple recursion, but they produced a list. Now, the interesting thing is here, could we abstract what they were doing into a function that builds a list. You give it a number and a function, and it produces a list 
for you? And the answer is yes. And it is a built-in function, just like all of the others we've talked about. It's called build list. And it consumes two arguments. The first argument is the number of elements you want in your list. And the second argument is the function that you will want to apply to each of those items in the list. And build list is actually abstracting the count up pattern. So let's look at my build list. So what my build list is going to do is it's going to, we pass it, n, which is the number of elements we want in our list, and f, which is the function I want to apply to each of the elements in my list. And then I have an internal helper function called list from, because I want to count up from 0 to n. So I'm going to start called list from with my initial value of 0. Now, if the value that I'm, count, I'm currently at is greater than or equal to n, I am done. I've produced all of the elements for the list I need, so I produce empty. So that's my base case there. Again, this was count up. You want to count up from 0 to 5? Well, when i is equal to 5, we have counted. We're done. So when i is greater than or equal to n, we stop and we produce empty. Otherwise, we want to add an element to our list. So we are going to cons i onto the result we get from creating a list from i plus 1 to n. Now you'll note here that if we didn't have this f, function f, applied to i, this would actually just produce the list 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, dot, 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 to n minus 1. That just gives us a list that counts up from 0. Maybe I want a list of all the even numbers in the world, or maybe I want a list of all the odd numbers, or maybe I want a list of all the prime numbers. We want to produce an interesting list. So build list lets us pass in a function that we apply to each of the elements of the list. So instead of just cons in count up, we just cons the number onto the results of counting up from i plus 1 to n. Well, now we're going to cons f of i onto the results of counting from i to plus 1 to n. So that is our implementation of build list. And again, build list is actually built in. So there's an example here. I'm not going to go over this example. What I would like to do instead is what I would like to do. We're not going to combine right now. We are going to go into bracket, and I would like to give you a few examples of actually building a list. So here we've got so I want to build a list of even numbers and um, n is the number of even numbers I want so I'm going to use build list so I want the first n even numbers how would I do this well 2 is 1 times 2 4 is 2 times 2, 6 is 2 times 3, 8 is 2 times 4. So I think what we want to do here is to build the list of the first n evens. The function I want to give to build list is a function that multiplies the item i by 2. So I'm going to pass n as the number of elements I want to create. And then my lambda function is going to consume only one thing is going to multiply x by 2. So let's run this. And now we will call evens. Let's get the first 10 even numbers. And there we go. And again, it starts at 0 because remember in computer science, we always start counting at 0. So that's pretty cool. What if I wanted 
a list of the powers of two. Well, we could do that as well. So let's do powers of two. We can use build list here. And we'll pass in n again, because that's how many powers of 2 I want to create. Now my function this time is going to use exponent. So let's run that. So now if we call powers of 2, and let's get the first 12 powers of 2. Whoops, I think we might have put something in the wrong order. What did we do that was wrong? So, that was just squaring everything. That's not what we wanted to do. We wanted to do two to the power of x. See how easy it is to make mistakes? This is why contracts and design recipes are so important, is to remind us what order arguments have to go in to do what we want. So let's do powers. Oh, I don't think I actually ran. Let's run this again. And I'll do powers. Helps if I can spell. Powers of two. Let's do the first 12. There we go. That's what I was expecting. All right. Now you might be asking, what is the contract for build list? Well, what is the contract for build list? Build list takes two arguments. And the first argument is a natural number because we're producing some number of elements. You can't produce half of an element. And then we take a function that consumes one thing and produces one thing. And this is going to produce a list of something. Well, we know that the function that is applied to all of the elements in the list, and if you think about it, build list does count up and then applies map. That's really what it does. So, our function here, since our list is in build list is always going to be initially numbers, we know that this is going to be mat. What does it have to produce? Does it have to produce a list of natural numbers? Does it have to produce a list of numbers at all? And the answer is no, because we could take a list of natural a list of natural numbers and with a function turn it into a binary search tree, or whatever you want. So this is more accurate to say what build lists contract would be, and that's kind of weird to reason about. All right, so now we have our five super powerful abstract list functions. And what we can see is that if we can put them together, we can actually build some really cool stuff. So for example, let's suppose you wanted to write a racket function that computes this sum here, where we don't actually know um, what f is going to be. f is going to be some function. So I want to compute the sum from i equals 0 to n minus 1 of f of i. So if that was 2 times i, that would be 0 plus 2 plus 4 plus 6 plus 8, so on and so forth. So I want to write a function to compute this sum, and let's use only abstract list functions to do it. Okay, so one of the things that we could do is we could start by building the list. So actually create all of the elements. So from i equals 0 to n minus 1, I want f of 0, f of 1, f of 2, f of 3, f of 4. We know how to do that. We use build list. So here's build list. I'm creating n elements because remember we're going to go from 0 to n minus 1, which is n elements. And then I want f of 0, f of 1. So my function is f. So I've created the list. And now I want to sum the list. So I use fold r to sum starting at 0. And so now if I want to create the sum of the first 
four squared numbers. I do sum four square. And that is going to, and this is again a very condensed trace, we are calling fold r with plus and zero build list four square. So if I call build list four square, it's going to produce the list zero because zero squared is zero. One, one squared is one. Four because two squared is four. And nine because three squared is nine. So now I have my list constructed for use with fold r. So now I'm going to sum those numbers up which of course is going to give me 14. Now, could I have used fold L and build list? Yes. Could I have just not used build list at all? I'll let you think about that one. Um, that'll be an exercise. So you can combine these together into a single line. And if you think about this, if you actually had to write this function here without these deep abstract list functions, it would be some nasty four or five line recursive function. The advantage of these abstract list functions is they just took all the recursion away from you. All right. Now, is there anything else we could go back and simplify using our abstract list functions? Well, you remember that multiplication table that we had to create? where we specify the number of rows we want and the number of columns, and then we produced a table. And we started off with like slides and slides of code where we just had simple recursion. And then we added locals so that we could not have so many weird helpers at the top level. We can now just choose build list. So what we're going to do is we have a build list for the rows and then for each row we have a second build list which builds the columns so the interior build list is going to produce from R to C and the exterior one is R so R is going to be what row am I producing right now so it's going to do row 0 row 1 row 2 row 3 to n minus 1 and then for each of those rows I'm going to produce column 0 column 1 column 2 to whatever number of columns we are creating so that multiplication table function which was all these helpers and it was super messy it can be completely turned into two applications of build list just like this which is quite beautiful and that's part of the real fun of these abstract list functions is you can take this code that you wrote at the beginning of the term that was like 100 lines and you can now turn it into two. But I do want to caution you about this because it can get very complicated to read. If you've got fold R's and fold R's and build lists and fold L's, it gets very, very complicated. So make sure when you're doing this that you are nice and you divide things up onto multiple lines and add comments. They're not so much for the TAs, but they're more for you so that you know what you're doing. And make sure you do lots of samples to make sure that it does exactly what you think it does. All right then, with that, that is actually the end of module 14, which leaves us with just two modules to go. Um, so this module was, of course, all about lambda and abstract list functions. Our next module is going to be generative recursion, and our last module is going to be graphs. We are not, unfortunately, going to have time to cover the very last topic, which is computing history. Um, but if you're interested, by all means, please do read that yourself. All right, so let's switch over to module 15 here. All right. So we've been talking a lot about recursion because this is really a course that you learn all about how to solve problems with recursion. And we've talked about simple recursion and we've talked about accumulative recursion. And we've talked very briefly about generative recursion and now we're actually going to go a little bit deeper into generative recursion. So what is generative recursion? So to remember what generative recursion is, let's review the kinds of recursion that you already know so far. You have simple recursion where we are following that data definition really close. 
and we are going to, with each recursive st application, move exactly one step closer to our base case. That's simple recursion. And if there's any other arguments that are passed along, they don't change. So with each step, we are moving exactly one step closer to base. Then a cumulative recursion is all of the rules of simple recursion, but we allow one more thing, and that is a parameter that is used to accumulate the results so far. And within that a guideline of simple recursion and a cumulative recursion, we can do things like lockstep, we can do things where lists are processed at different rate, and they still fall under those two headings. Because in each case, we are moving exactly one step closer to base. Then we have mutual recursion which is where we, we usually have encountered that so far, working with trees. And remember, mutual recursion is when you have a function A calls function B, and then B goes back and calls function A. So you have this little loop going on. And the nice thing about simple and accumulative recursion is you have to think of a base case and an initial value maybe for your accumulator. Mutual recursion is tricky because you're not dealing with a single function anymore. Now you're dealing with functions calling each other. And so it can get really complicated trying to figure out what are my base cases? Generative recursion is a whole other monkey. Generative recursion doesn't follow a data definition. There's no concept of each recursive application moves exactly one step closer to the base case. We don't know with each recursive application how much closer to our base we are getting. And it's going to be very much problem specific. So for generative recursion, the recursive step is more of a function that we are applying. So to remind you of what that is, let's go over to one of the generative recursive examples we had earlier in the course. So you might remember that we talked about Euclid's method for computing uh, the greatest common divisor of two numbers, n and m. And um, it's actually a recursive definition. And um, so here was the solution to it. If m, the second argument, is 0, we are done. And n is the greatest common divisor. So that's actually the base case, is when the second argument it becomes 0. But our recursive application, we are not inching m towards 0. Because what we do is our new value of m on our next recursive application of Euclid's GCD is the remainder between n and n. So, how many does that go down by? Does it always go down? Does it ever go up? It's based on a function. This is not simple recursion. This is not a cumulative recursion. This is generative recursion. And it is very difficult to think about. Now, we're not going to prove to you that that method on the previous slide actually works uh, because that's done in Math 135. And admittedly, I took Math 135 almost 20 years ago. So the big question we have to ask is this question of termination. So one of the most important things about a program is that it terminates. So if you write a function that computes the sum of the list, you want that program to terminate when it's done computing the sum of the list. And you want to guarantee that that program actually terminates. It actually finishes. Because if it doesn't, it will run forever. And as a part of simple recursion and accumulative recursion, their very definitions are making sure that we are going to guarantee termination because we are always moving one step closer to the base case. But with generative recursion, there's a new concept like that. So how do we know that our program terminates? Now, interesting story. This concept of knowing whether our program terminates or not is incredibly famous. Um, so the question is, can you write a program that will determine if another program terminates or not? And the answer is you can't, right? And there is a proof for this. And um, if you're curious to see it, you'll do it soon enough in CS341. It's called the halting problem. We cannot write a program to determine whether another program will stop or not. So we need to be certain when we write code that we know it terminates. 
Now, one of the things that we look at with recursive functions is this concept of recursive depth. And um, this is related to termination. So what is the depth of recursion? How many steps does it take before we arrive at our base case? How many steps does it take before we terminate? So if we go back and we look at something like a simple recursive function, like summing the number of things in a list, we can actually compute the depth of this recursion. And if we look at this, how many recursive applications of sum list are required before we arrive at the base case? So our initial call is number one. Then we process three, that's number two. Then we process six, that's our third call. And then we have four, and that's our fourth call. And then finally, we've arrived at our base case. So there's our recursive depth. But this is interesting because the depth of the recursion, the number of recursive applications before we arrive at the base case was equal to the number of items in the list. And that's true for simple recursion. For simple recursion, the depth of recursion is bound by the number of items in the list. Generally, the same is true for cumulative recursion. So what is the bounds on the number of steps we're going to take to terminate with the Euclid's GCD? Well, we know that M is always going to be greater than N mod M, which means that our M value should be getting smaller each time. So we could say that the depth of recursion for Euclid's greatest common divisor is actually going to be bound by the number m. Now, does bound by the number m mean that is the true depth of recursion? That's the exact number of recursive steps we take before we terminate? No, and in fact, in practice, Euclid's GCD is faster than that because we're not taking m down by one each time. It may work out that way, but most of the time it's much faster than that. Okay, so in order to think about the depth of recursion for Euclid's Grace Common Divisor, in order to figure out does it terminate, we actually had to look at the math. And this is very closely related to the proof of this. Let's look at another problem. So this is a very famous problem called the Collatz Conjecture. And it can be evaluated, it's a recursive function. And this is very, very old, this problem. And the question is, does this terminate? So what it says is you call this function collats on a number n. And if n is equal to one, produce one, you are done. That's your base case. However, if n is even, you're going to call collats on n over two. And if n is odd, we call collats on three n plus one. And the question we want to know is, does this terminate for all inputs n? We do not know that. We have no idea after decades. We still do not know whether the Collatz conjecture uh, always terminates. We have no idea. So one of the ways that you can see what's actually going on here, so this is a generative recursive function because how many recursive steps is based on a function. One of the easiest ways to see that is to actually take collats and have it actually produce the list of all the numbers. So I've actually taken this over to racket. So I'm going to open up racket here. I think I have it in number four. There we go. Oh, that's ugly. Let's tidy this up a bit. And this is one of those weird pieces of code. You will note that, yes, there is indeed, we are consing n onto a cond. And that's because the cond is going to produce empty in the base case. It's going to produce collats list on n over 2 if n is even, and collats list on 3n plus 1 if we are odd. So it's a little weird, but that's one of the fun things about cond is you can put it anywhere, right? Okay, so what lists does this give us? So let's call collats on one. Make sure I can spell it right. There we go. We get a list of one because that's the base case. We're done. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, what if I call collats on two? 
Should that terminate? Well, if we look at this, we see if n is even, which it is, we call collets on n over 2. Well, n over 2 is 1. So I'm expecting this to produce a list of two items. And it does. What about 3, though? What just happened? Instead of producing, we had Colette's list 1 produced a list of 1, Colette's list 2 produced a list of t, and you might be thinking, well, Colette's 3, it's some really small number. I anticipate it's going to produce, you know, three elements. Colette's on 3, there are eight elements in that list. Because it's an odd number, we call Colette's on 3n plus 1, so we're calling Colette's on 10. 10 is even, so we call Colette's on 5. 5 is odd, so we call Colette's on 3 times 5 plus 1. That's 16. And that's even, so we call it on 8. And then that divides by 2 and divides by 2, and then finally we get to the base. That's crazy. What about, what happens when we call this on 4? Now you might be thinking, well, maybe it produces an even bigger list. But now it's producing a smaller list. We have no idea if this terminates for all values of n. We could even produce, let's, let's just get a big number here. Um, let's do 500 to n, no, 512 is too easy. Uh, 512 does terminate because it's a power of 2. So it's always going to be, we're going to divide 512 by 2. That gives us 256, which gives us 128, which gives us 64. So that one works. Let's do instead 513. And if we compare this to the list we get from 514, oh my goodness, look at that. That's insane. The difference between calling collats on 513 and 514, even though those two numbers are one apart, is huge. So this is a very, very famous problem. We have no idea if this actually terminates, but it is generative recursion. Um, so what do we do about that? Well. You have to be really careful with generative recursion. That's the answer. All right. So collets is not very useful. <laughs> but let's actually look at a generative recursive problem that is useful. And that is my favorite sorting algorithm known as quicksort. So quicksort is an example of what's known as a divide and conquer. We are going to take a problem that is very, very big and seems very, very hard, and we're going to divide it into smaller problems, and then solve the smaller subproblems, and then somehow combine all of the results of the subproblems back into a single result. And that's what quicksort does. What quicksort is going to do is it's going to take a list of numbers, and it's going to choose a number known as the pivot from that list. And everything that is smaller than the pivot becomes a new list. Everything that is bigger than the pivot becomes a second list. And we're going to do this recursively to sort the list. Then we're going to append the sorted numbers that are smaller to the pivot to the sorted list of numbers that were bigger. So we're recursively dividing this into smaller and smaller subproblems. So just to show you what this would look like. So typically, um, well, not typically. There are many different ways you can choose this pivot. In this course, we're always going to choose the first element, but I'm going to let you know that choosing the first one isn't necessarily the most efficient. It's just the easiest. So if we choose 9 as our pivot, then our subproblems is sorting a list 4, 2, which is the number smaller than 9, and sorting the list 15, 12, 20. Now, we then sort those two sublists probably with a recursive application of quicksort on each, and then we need to combine the results of those subproblems all together. Well, how do you combine a bunch of sorted lists together? With the append function. So we're going to append our sorted list of numbers that are smaller with the list containing the pivot with the list of sorted things that were bigger than the pivot. And there you go. There's quicksort in a nutshell. Now the code for this is actually quite simple, especially if we take advantage of things like filter. We can use filter to, given our pivot, get it all the things that are less than the pivot and all the things that are greater than the pivot. So in this case, we've just shown you applying filter to create the list of things that are smaller than the pivot. All right. So here's our quick sort function. And um, you will notice we're calling it my quicksort, and that's because my quicksort is actually a built-in function. 
Now, you'll notice that we have a helper function inside. So if the list is empty, we produce empty because there's nothing to sort. Otherwise, we need to divide and conquer. So what we're going to do is we choose our pivot to be the first element. Then we're going to filter and get all those elements less than the pivot. We filter and get all the elements greater than the pivot. So there's our greater and our less. And then we are going to append the result of calling quick sort on the list smaller to the pivot to the list we get from calling quick sort on the items that are bigger than the pivot. And you're done. And quick sort is a generative recursive problem because there is not a guarantee that each of these recursive applications move exactly one step closer to the base case. Now you might be wondering, why is that true? Well, let's look at how you move to termination. First off, we know quick sort terminates. It's actually quite easy to show quick sort terminates. Think of it this way. The pivot is going to be separated from the list of items. So if you have a list of 1,000 items and you choose the first one for the pivot, you're now, even if all of the items in the list are bigger than the pivot, the list you're calling quick sort on no longer contains the pivot. So you're always reducing the lists by at least one element. But, so we do know that that will terminate because eventually you'll end up with a list of one element, which will just be the pivot, and then we're done. We're at our base case. We're calling quick sort on empty. So we know that quick sort terminates. Does it always take that long to terminate, though? Are we always going to have to do this each time? No. This is why it's generative. It's because sometimes the pivot will lie in the middle of the numbers, and so we'll be dividing the list in two. Or sometimes 25% of the elements will be smaller and 75% bigger. We don't know how the size of the list is going to change um, application to application. It doesn't follow the simple template. It doesn't follow the accumulative template. But we do know that it terminates. Now, you have to be very careful with quicksort because in order to make it terminate, the pivot has to be removed from the subproblems. So if you accidentally used greater than or equal to in your filtering, this would not terminate because your pivot wouldn't end up getting removed from the list. And so the list wouldn't actually shrink in the worst case. So be very, very careful about that. All right, I'm going to leave this here. We'll do an example of showing you how quick sort works uh, next class. And then we will finish up with generative recursion and we will start graphs. And I know some of you might be a little familiar with graphs and not looking forward to it, but we'll do our best to make it interesting. All right, so make sure that you are staying inside and that you are staying safe, and we will see you next week.